makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. A very good morning. Welcome to The Pulse. I'm Manish Krenny in Dubai. With the conversations that matter coming up on today's program, European stocks are lower. Disappointing data from China renews the concern over the nation's fragile economic recovery. We also bring you the ECB's latest inflation survey in just a moment. China is reportedly set to launch a new state-backed investment fund that aims to raise around $40 billion. It's for the semiconductor industry. Plus, Israel's central bank keeps rates on change, breaking with the Fed's decision to tighten policy. We discuss with the bank's governor later this hour. Breaking news for you across the Bloomberg terminal. This is about inflation, uh, and this is the state of play on the European map. It's about confidence. There is a lack of confidence that China has put a floor under the economic situation as the Kaishin slides to the lowest since 2023. So the risk of stagflation in Europe rises. But when it comes to Europe, the ECB says three-year consumer expectations rise. And this is not what Philip Lane uh, and his cohorts want to see. Philip Lane talks about a peak, uh, a second round peak in inflation. The ECB's three-year consumer inflation expectations rose in July. The one year comes in at 3.4 percent, so that's pretty much in line. But on the forward basis in three years, 2.4 percent, the consensus estimate was for 2.3 Percent. You are seeing as uh, services and the composite number uh, from the HCOB come in a little bit lighter. Again, all of this is driving at the woes of Europe. The momentum for stagflation is fervent. Let me show you what is happening across the assets. The Aussie is down on the back of the Chaixin being the lowest in 2023, despite the latest red headline on stimulus from China for the chip sector. That is not alone. The Aussie is down now 1.3%. It was a hawkish hike from the RBA. Some more tightening may come. But the unsettling of the services data in Australia has indeed uh, irked the Aussie high beta, high reaction function to poor data. NYMEX is down by a quarter of 1%, despite the fact that Goldman say you're going to have a large deficit going into the second half, or the last quarter, I should say. There's a fragility to the oil market, according to Trafigura, and they are seeing $100 oil call options trade with size. Rates rise ever so slightly after Labor Day, 4.9%. Uh, do you want to gorge on short-dated paper? We will ask our CIO that question. Euro continues lower, again, the lowest since June, as you are seeing this fervent dollar uh, continue. Standard Chartered were with me yesterday saying short the dollar, but the euro is lower on those inflation expectations and actually uh, a paucity of good news from China. Weaker dollar, weaker euro, excuse me, stronger dollar. Let's talk about the inflation expectations. Zoe Schweizwes is with me, our Western European uh, economics editor. Good to see you. How are you, Zoe? Talk me through this. Three years out, we're not that optimistic that Mr. Lane... Mr. Lane has a different perception of optimism on inflation than the reality out there. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, those numbers today must have come as a bit of a shock. As you said, the three-year number... Uh, Consumer expectations for inflation three years out um, unexpectedly um, increased. It was at 2.3, now it's at 2.4. 0.1% vantage point increase isn't something huge, but it's just a move in the wrong direction. And at the same time, the 12 month ahead number, that one failed to slow. So that one's been slowing for three months, and now it did not. So overall, those are not the data those people on the governing council who think it might be time for a pause will be wanting. And that comes, of course, after last week's actual hard inflation data. This today just is a survey. So consumers can be wrong. Hard data actually tells the story. And as a reminder, last week's inflation data saw underlying inflation slow, but again, the headline number stood pat. Both of those are 5.3. And as we all know, the ECB's inflation target is 2%. So that isn't really good news. Well, let me give you an old hint, which is if you feel poor, you are poor, you spend less and you restrain yourself from spending. Well, that's just old fashioned human nature rather than hard data. Now, the chief economist, Philip Lane, he's in the Irish Times, I think, today talking about this slowdown in the core inflation. He's fairly confident. What would that mean in terms of the rates narrative, Zoe? 
So um, the ECB, their mandate is headline inflation. Core inflation is, though, the, uh, the number that, core inflation, that's the number that strips out um, volatile elements such as energy and food. That one has been continuously slowing, and they have been saying that's the number they care about more, because if underlying um, isn't um, calming down, then headline eventually will start increasing again. So the underlying number, him giving an indication they think it will slow, and as a reminder, next week we get new economic forecasts, that would be an indication that they want to hold. Overall, though, it's slightly a mixed picture because um, they, Lagarde um, in July said very clearly um, September will be a hike or a hold. And there are some elements that say a hike actually might be needed. And the more hawkish uh, members of the governing council and the weekend we just had the Belgian central banker, um, Wunsch, they were like, there might, a little more might be needed. And the argument the hawks are making is it's better to hike too much than not enough. Whereas the doves are saying, look at the economy. We need, it, it's about time we stop. And they got, they got um, backing from, they're getting backing from politicians in that respect as well. Yesterday, Spain's deputy prime minister, um, Calvino, said it would be good time for the ECB to stop hiking rates. And the Italians, as we know, have been very vocal saying the ECB has done too much already. Well, I mean, I mean, look, it's it, it, it's a broad church and it's a hard family to, to satisfy, isn't it? Um, if we talk about growth versus inflation, how is that debate playing out? I mean, I like what Lagarde had to say, which is, you know, she, she's certainly holding the suspense for us, isn't it? Which is, you know, action over words. But where are we on the growth? I used the word stagflation, Zoe, when I talked about China and the transmission mechanism, the tail risk from China into Europe. Stagflation is a very real and present danger in the European context. It is, and last week we got the minutes from the ECB um, July meeting, and those minutes clearly stated that um, that some governors are worried about stagflation. So um, the issue here is that the East, that the euro area just is basically treading water, that it's not growing, and that that means that, and that there is in fact the danger here that we will that numbers will, in fact, go into, that will go into another recession. So Germany, as we know, is one of those um, countries that typically is the engine of Europe, and that's doing very poorly. So um, there is, they, the idea here is that if growth is weak enough, that that actually will force um, inflation down. Um, but again, is that something you really want to be, um, play roulette with the European economy? Is that something they want to focus on? And what the hawks will all tell you is our mandate is price stability. So if inflation still is more than twice our target, what are we doing about um, thinking about holding? Uh, now, Zoe, if you want to talk about playing roulette with the, the European economy, you only have to go back to the foothills of history for the European debt crisis, to Greece, to, 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 to the at-dawn moment. I'll leave you with this thought, Zoe. The weekly fear index is at the highest level since October as the downside risks prevail in the euro. Now, listen, I'm off. You won't have me for a while, so we'll have another go at your name so that you don't throw dartboards, uh, darts at the name. It is Zoe Schneeweiss there in our Frankfurt office. I nearly got there, Zoe. Forgive me. On the latest with European data. So China has set to launch a $40 billion state fund. What's the aim? to boost the semiconductor industry. That's according to a Reuters report out just under an hour ago. Will it work? Let's bring in Rebecca Chung Wilkins in Hong Kong. Rebecca, good to see you. Here we go. Another arrow from the quiver of stimulus. How, how big an arrow is this? Come on. Well, for the first time, this sort of mode of stimulus, rather than, let's say, the rate cuts and so on that we've seen, actually really also align with Beijing's sort of broader goal here. It's increased emphasis on national security, the desire to push back against all these efforts by the US and allies to de-risk and ultimately to kind of really shore up its own ability in these areas of strategic technology. So we know that in addition to sort of this kind of stimulus via this sort of state fund, there is also quite a lot of support and backing in the private sectors as well, particularly when it comes to this industry in supporting development here. So it's one of those mechanisms that comes with broader market uh, and investor support. 
Like country garden is the story that has stolen the headlines in, in perpetuity. You know, we, we have been one step away from default on a number of moments. We understand there is a payment on some bonds that is going to be made. That is a stay of execution. Is that long term? Is that enduring? Or is it a temporary reprieve? Your assessment. Well, look, when you just see at the bond levels, the pricings today, bonds somewhere between 13, 14, 15 cents on the dollar, that says it all really. Even with this avoidance of an official default, uh, investors are not pricing in any particularly high rate of recovery here at all. Um, so they have rustled up this $22.5 million, they say, and they have told note holders, in order to avoid uh, an official default, they've made that payment within the grace period. But country Garden, even just this year, has to raise another just over half a billion US dollars to pay off at least four mm. bond uh, maturities and another coupon that comes due this month. So we're certainly not over the sort of will they, won't they excitement that we've seen all through the last 30 days of this grace period. What, yeah, it's probably more than excitement, isn't it? It's sort of, you know, fear, loathing and terror uh, in terms of the tail risk. Rebecca, thank you so much. Rebecca Chung Wilkins in Hong Kong. Coming up, we're going to dive into these markets, get a little bit more on the ECB inflation narrative on the expectation survey. Grace Peters joins me, the EMEA head of investment strategy at JP Morgan Private Bank on Bloom. Let's recap the breaking news that we've had in the past couple of minutes. Now, a lot of it comes down to the inflation outlook for the Eurozone. And the top line this morning was the Euro area services. First of all, the PMI there falls to 47.9 from a preliminary reading of 48.3. So again, a lagging in the services and three year consumer expectations rose in July. And that is the rub of the issue for Philip Lane and Christine Lagarde in terms of where we are. The three-year perspective on rates and expectations of inflation are at 3.4% and in one, sorry, 2.4% in three years and 3.4% in one year. That's going in the right direction, some people would say, but it's still above target. Um, and Lane describes peak second round moments in inflation uh, with the effects of prior increases now feeding through to the economy. Let's take all of that. A lot of data, a lot of verbiage, but let's see what the managing director for EMEA, head of investment strategy, Grace Peters, makes of it. Grace, you know, we can do battle over numbers and, and where we are, but there, the, the trajectory of inflation is on the turn. The trajectory for central bank rates is careering towards the peak. How much more important is it for you and I to consider peak ECB, Fed and Aussie relative to these inflation prints this morning? Well, I think what's you know, important about the inflation print this morning is that it speaks to the degree or not to which inflation is anchored when it comes to, to the Eurozone. Um, we know that the arguments for an ECB pause are certainly growing, um, particularly with those weak PMI numbers. But what the ECB needs to see is very clear, compelling evidence um, that inflation is on its way down, um, you know, with that lagged effect of, of interest rate hikes that we've already had. And I think that this morning's data particularly looking at that three-year number nudging up slightly, um, you know, is mm. not really what the ECB would have wanted to hear. But we're going to get to a point, you know, 2.3, 2.4 is not so far from the 2% target. And we're going to get a point like they have with US um, consumer um, inflation expectations where we start to change a bit more range bound and perhaps we're, we're there. Um, we do think that we are close to the peak in rates. We think that the Fed is now on pause and that the ECB has probably got one more rate hike um, in it. Perhaps they're going to, to, to do a little pause um, as the Fed did in June um, on the 14th of September. But one more weight hike, but we're almost there. And we know that when it comes to the pause in rates, that's generally a positive um, for risk assets. Um, and so our mantra for this year has been weaker growth, stronger markets, as we anticipate um, the eventual pause across the developed world central banks. What is the biggest risk? On a daily basis, we're talking about country garden. We're talking about intervention in the China 
uh, growth story. I'm using words around stagflation in Europe, so is the ECB. When you look at the biggest risk, is it squarely in Europe and China relative to the U.S.? And therefore, does that drive the exceptionalism of U.S. equities in your book? I think that you've got obvious risks around the world, you know, around growth and inflation, and that they are at the moment centred um, in Europe and China, as, as you point out, Manus. I think other risks that have really um, captured the market's attention over the last three months um, and have ultimately pushed up term premium within bond markets is also government debt um, and this notion that something's changed. Something's changed in the construct of the economy. Um, you know, those forward-looking inflation um, numbers also speak to the idea that the landing point for inflation is structurally higher. And obviously there are knock-on implications um, when that comes to, um, you know, as I mentioned, government debt, financing, um, and, and, and therefore across asset classes. So one of the most interesting interesting things that I um, observe um, is the relative risk premium between equities and bonds. Um, we've seen over mm. the last 18 months um, equity risk premium come down. Um, and I think that's reflective of the fact that equities, if inflation's in a, you know, 3 to 4 percent bucket, um, equities are actually quite a good hedge for inflation. And therefore, the risk premium that you're um, commanding in the equity market has fallen over a period of time. Um, and that's obviously helped support valuations um, as, as we think about the year-to-date rally. Now, the reverse is true in, in, in the bond market. Actually, term premium, the risk premium, the, what you need to be compensated to own fixed income, has risen. And but particularly it's risen over the last two months um, as we look to you know, U.S. debt ceiling discussions, um, the U.S. debt downgrade, um, and you know, what is still um, you know, a risky environment when it comes to that outlook for inflation. So that, to me, when we think about not just sort of you know, risks that we've been talking about for a while, um, but how that actually gets priced in the market okay. is, is a very interesting um, you know, sort of uh, observation. It's interesting that you talk about the term premium, so that makes it much more, uh, much more appealing. E e even myself, I look at it. I mean, I've got a producer here who says that new luggage that you bought will see you out. The new passport that I've got will see me out, and I really should be buying bonds at four point three percent because technically that would see me up over the hill. But here's the thing: bonds are going to deliver the third. Con well, a caveat. There's a potential that bonds can deliver the third annualised loss, and we haven't seen that in 250 years. The question is, is there enough term premium in there to justify you allocating more to bond than to equity, or incrementally taking some duration relative to equity? Briefly, Grace. Yeah, look, incrementally, we're happy to take a little more duration. I think the most compelling part of the bond market still remains um, at the front end, looking out sort of to three years, um, where you're not taking extended duration risk, um, but you are still capitalised, as you say, on those on those higher yields. We are equity bulls. Our target for the S&P is 4,800. Um, but I think that there is that um, argument, particularly as you think in the portfolio context, to hedge for weaker growth, that extending duration a little looks increasingly compelling, particularly in the US, where we do think that the Fed is now um, on pause. Well, at least we, we, didn't, we didn't manage to get you to say what BlackRock did, which was two-year notes are screaming by, Grace. But uh, your, your, your elegance in the definition of duration, you see, that's the difference between JP Morgan Private Bank uh, and perhaps BlackRock. The uh, JP Morgan Bank EMEA Head of Investment Strategy, Grace Peters, our guest this morning on markets. We've got more ahead for you. Uh, we digest the inflation data. We ponder on duration and we look forward to the Israel Central Bank Governor with my co-host from Daybreak Middle East and Africa, Yusuf Gamal al -Din, in just under 10 minutes. It's the conversations that matter, the insights that you need right here on The Pulse every day. I'm Menace Cranny in for Francine Lacroix today. We've had a lot to deal with. The Aussies go for a hawkish hike, and that, to a certain extent, 
uh, has moved some of the FX markets, which you are looking at here. You're looking now at the pound down three quarters of 1%, the euro off four tenths of 1%. The dollar is rising. You can see all of these equity markets are under pressure. Switzerland and the CAC of 1.2%. So you are just seeing that run into the dollar. Uh, you are seeing inflation expectations ramp uh, a little bit higher in Europe. And this is not the way it was supposed to be. The ECB says consumer inflation expectations is higher in July. And so what you are seeing three years out, they rise to 2.4%. So still ahead of that 2% target. But you are seeing money go into the dollar overall. We're in a slightly risk off narrative. That's what's driving the dollar rather than the euro in that respect. So keep an eye on that. Uh, let's uh, get ready for the conversation with the Bank of Israel Governor Amir Yaron in just a moment on Bloomberg. Euro area consumer expectations for inflation three years are unexpectedly increased remaining above the ECB's 2% target. China is reportedly set to launch a new state-backed investment fund that aims to raise $40 billion for its semiconductor industry. Plus, Israel Central Bank keeps rates unchanged, breaking with the Fed's decision policy tightening. We'll hear from the bank's governor next. A very good morning. Welcome to The Pulse. I'm Manus Krenny in Dubai. We promised you that uh, exclusive conversation with Israel's central bank keeping interest rates unchanged, breaking with the Fed's last decision to tighten policy, even as the shekel depreciated to a three-year low. My daybreak Middle East and Africa co-host Yusuf Kamel al-Din joins us now with the central bank governor for Israel. Yusuf. Thanks, man. As well, they keep their benchmark rates unchanged at 4.75 percent. I want to discuss some of the policy implications with the governor himself, uh, Amir Yaron, and he joins us now for a closer look at all of these moves. Governor, thank you for making time. It's fantastic to get you back on Bloomberg TV. In terms of the data that we're getting from all around the world, it tells a story of a fight against inflation that is not won yet. We had data out from South Korea, upside surprise there. It's a similar story out of Europe over the last few hours. Talk to me about how a higher import bill is going to make it a lot more difficult for the Bank of Israel to reach its target by the end of this year. Yusuf, good morning. Uh, we believe that the current rate is in a restrictive uh, territory that barring uh, surprises, and we are all data dependent, and that's why we said there's also a non-trivial chance that we might need to continue to raise rates, but right now, uh, even though inflation is at 3.3 percent, we believe the next reading it will be at four. But even with the current exchange rate, expectations are anchored and we see a process whereby inflation comes back into the target by Q1 uh, 24. And we have uh, above one percent real interest rate. Uh, and so we believe in our economy, this should uh, bring us back into the target without damaging the economic activity more that's uh, needed. So, Governor, the shekel is down about 8% uh, so far against the U.S. dollar in 2023. Uh, I look at some of the other currency dynamics, and the question becomes, is this something that you can control with tighter monetary policy, that depreciation, or is this something that's going to be up to the government to address? Yusuf, this is, um, let me take a step back. Uh, the shekel has had a very tight uh, correlation or relationship with the developments in the financial markets abroad. That link has weakened significantly since the beginning of the year, uh, a lot due to the uncertainty that has been brought about by the judicial changes. And we are seeing the market basically trying to figure out the appropriate risk premium that's associated with that. And we believe the market should de is, is the one that should determine that uh, risk premium. So far, although there's been a significant increase in volatility of the shekel, markets have functioned well without any uh, market 
uh, failure, and that's why we we let the markets dictate that. At three, at, at around the the current rate, it, the market expectation, as I mentioned, are already incorporating that into the, uh, their transmission into inflation. And nonetheless, we are seeing them uh, saying that we uh, will be back into the target at Q1 24. So I think a lot of it yeah. is it basically surrounding the issues that I mentioned regarding the un un uncertainty. And uh, right now, uh, barring uh, market failures or very, very uh, significant changes uh, that would impede okay. uh, on uh, getting inflation into the target, we should let the markets de determine them. I mean, here's the thing. I look at the, the performance of the greenback, the Bloomberg dollar index, not the highest level since March. And if dollar strength was a headwind so far this year, maybe it's going to be a tailwind for the remainder of the year. Do you think that we have reached peak or get, are getting closer to peak Fed rates, i.e. peak dollar strength? Um, I, I think uh, the Fed is signaling that it's uh, getting closer to the end of its cycle. And uh, as long as uh, mar markets and, and the economy there is uh, functioning well um, and we don't see any reasons for a uh, flight to quality, um, th you know, th the gap between the interest rate uh, probably uh, should favor um, some, some strengthening if you hold all other things equal. But as I said, uh, right now, uh, some of the traditional uh, correlations that we've seen in the past are masked by some of the uncertainty uh, that is going on uh, internally here in Israel. There's a lot of speculation as to whether or not you're going to hang around for a second term. I know the Bank of Israel has publicly pushed back on some of that speculation. But I want to ask you very openly, do you actually want to do another term? Yusuf, as you mentioned, I'm close to um, to the end of my first term, almost five years. Perhaps uh, one of the most challenging uh, terms there have been in, in Israel, five election cycles, uh, COVID, uh, Ukraine-Russia war, infl worldwide inflation, and in, in Israel, and now a, a set of judicial reforms that are bringing about uh, a lot of uh, um, dispute in in, 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 in in the social fabric in Israel. And so, uh, you know, this is the background. Uh, I've said what I've said to, to, to many. I'm going to take the uh, holiday period that's coming here within the next couple of weeks to figure out what are my next uh, steps regarding that. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, stressful by any stretch of the imagination. So I, I, I do relate. But in terms of this structural achievement that Israel had been able to keep for many years, which was a politics-proof economy, is that now coming to an end? And do investors need to be newly sensitive to political risks? Because I look at the notes from Global Investment Bank's governor, and they're including the term political risk more and more in a lot of their analyses. Um. Clearly, uh, some of those uh, international banks and the rating agencies are pointing to uh, some of the risks associated with the uh, judicial reforms. Uh, I've been, uh, I've stated in the past that it's all economic literature points to the importance in order for have economic prosperity and growth uh, that uh, the institutions are strong and independent. And that's why, in spite of the fact that we have and entered 2023 with a very good fiscal stand, debt to GDP that is below 60%, a deficit that's going to be on the order of one to one and a half uh, percent on the governance issues, they are, you know, they are monitoring what is going on with respect to these uh, judicial reforms. And I've stated and continue to state that they have to be done mm -hmm. and it's imperative that they be done in a way that preserves the strength and independence of the institutions. And it's done in a way that is widely agreed upon across society. 
The other thing that we've been hearing at Bloomberg is that more companies are looking at moving cash out of Israel. That there's concerns, especially in high tech investments, that's going to be reduced amounts going forward because of the political volatility that's beginning to take shape. Is the central bank seeing any evidence of that or do you have any color that you could provide on that front? Um, we obviously monitor a lot of, uh, of, of, of the financial issues. Uh, we have not seen a macro effect of the type that uh, you, you've mentioned. Uh, but clearly, uh, the uncertainty that, uh, that is brought about, uh, you know, uh, makes investors, uh, uh, whether they're inside or outside, uh, judge things uh, a lot more carefully uh, regarding where the developed uh, mints might be regarding these judicial reforms. Governor, thank you for making the time. I know you've got a lot going on in your schedule, and I do hope uh, we uh, speak again in a formal and an informal capacity as well as uh, Governor Amir Yaron there from the Bank of Israel. Manis? Yusuf, thank you. Great conversation there. The governor telling us uh, well anchored inflation expectations as the RBA calls a peak in the from Israel, the RBA to arm. There are banks out there and they are quite literally salivating. Breaking news the bankers to arms IPO, they are going to go ka ching, ka ching, ka ching. 100 million bucks. They're going to get 2% fees, 1.75% uh, and 0.25% as an incentive. This is what we've got for you, the listing uh, of 28 banks. And just think some of the big names out there. You've got Barclays, you've got Goldman's, you've got JP Morgan on the roster, along with Mizuho. So you understand it breaks down like this. You're going to get 1.75% uh, on the actual business. And then you've got an incentive. Bankers like an incentive, 0.25% incentive fee awarded at the firm's discretion. So if you roll up with a blockbuster pillar investor, get ready for your 0.25%. Uh, Christmas could come quite literally early. Uh, this is the chip firm listing, uh, the ARM listing, which is going to be perhaps one of the biggest ones uh, this year. Payday for ARMS. There's money in chips. There's Barclays down six tenths of 1%. The investment bankers could do with a break. Uh, coming up, I caught up with the Chevron Whetstone downstream staff. And what's on offer? Let's find out. Is the walkout on at Chevron? We'll get an update on the industrial action in Australia. What it means for the LNG market right here on Bloomberg. We're committed to find a solution there, and we, we want to find a solution that's a win-win-win. We want to find it as a win for Chevron, a win for our employees, and a win for the gas market. Colin, let me follow up on that, uh, just to give our global audience some perspective on how heated the rhetoric is. Uh, this is a quote from the Offshore Alliance uh, when they made a statement. The log of claims will ultimately be claims which Chevron will agree to but not before they lose a few billion dollars, judging by the form guide, which is okay as Chevron clearly have plenty of loose change in the Chevron piggy bank. Uh, do you have any timeline as to how quickly you're willing to resolve the standoff? No, so I mean, if, if I go back and really just took and repeat what I said before, there, there are active conversation, there's active dialogue going on at the moment. So I'm really not going to comment on things that are around the edge, but to say that, look, we're really committed to find a solution here and we want to find a solution. And we, we understand solutions. You have to get a space that's a win for various parties. So we understand that it has to be good for our employees. It has to be good for us. And all of that will be good in the LNG market. So really, that's what we're committed to do. Yep, uh, that was uh, an interesting conversation there with the president of the midstream area, Chevron calling uh, Parfit speaking to myself and Yusuf a little bit earlier, an exclusive interview there. Coming up, uh, we've got more news on the Chevron Whitson Down Street staff in Australia. They've offered to work during the upcoming notified strikes to ensure domestic gas supplies. So let's get the very latest uh, on the European gas markets with Anna uh, Shiri Eva Skia. Anna. Here we go. Last week, I had 
uh, Woodside Petroleum talking about a febrile market. Here we are. We're looking at the risk of 7% of the global LNG market going out for a period of time. What is the latest? Uh, indeed, the deadline for the start of strikes is rapidly approaching. Uh, the workers at Wheatstone and Gorgon LNG plants in Australia threatened to start partial strikes on the 7th of September and followed by full 24-hour rolling hours for two weeks a week later next Thursday. Uh, as Mr. Profit mentioned, of course, talks are continuing between the labor unions and Chevron, so there is still hope the strikes could be averted. Uh, and as we heard recently, uh, Wheatstone downstream facility workers we offered to work during the plant industrial action. That only refers to the domestic gas supply plant to ensure uh, Chevron continues working to repair that plant after an outage and to ensure that Australian domestic consumers do not suffer. So then we often look at the supply situation for Europe. There's going to be this competition. If there is an outage of some description in Australia, it's going to be Europe bidding against uh, other buyers, Asian buyers for Aussie gas. How full are the tanks? Are we ahead of the curve? Are we ahead of the normal storage at this time, which causes so much angst last year when, uh, of course, Russia went to war against Ukraine? Uh well, it's worth noting that Europe does not directly receive any Australian LNG, so if there's any outage, it will affect Asian customers. But we shouldn't forget that at the moment we are still in a low demand season. We don't have any heating uh, season starting yet anytime soon for the next few weeks. It's, the demand is still muted both in Asia and in uh, Europe in particular. Uh, so for Europe, uh, there is no immediate concern. Storage um, sites are 93% full. Uh, there are a preliminary forecast that uh, the weather will continue to be mild into October, so that could potentially delay the start of the heating season. And we've seen actually over the last two weeks that LNG flows to Europe continue uh, quite strongly. Um, that's mainly supplied from the U.S. So there is no immediate danger at okay. the moment, even if the strikes do start uh, in the coming two weeks. Anna, thank you so much. That is uh, the very latest on the gas markets there with Anna Sherry Iveskia. Well, Big Tech is bracing for the European Union's biggest ever clampdown on anti-competitive practices, which may provoke a new wave of legal battles between the regulators and Silicon Valley. Now, the announcement on which tech platforms are to be targeted under the EU's Digital Markets Act is due tomorrow. What will be in it? What will it mean? Let's bring in our EU competition reporter, Sam Sultan. Sam, what is the objective of these new rules? Because we've had quite heated sparring over technology in the past sort of six, seven years. What's new? Well, hello there from Brussels here. And yes, these new rules don't actually come into play until early 2024, but the Commission is releasing a list of those platforms um, to come under the scope of those rules tomorrow. And it's really intended to stop at source many of those anti-competitive behaviours that we've seen over the past couple of decades in which Brussels has taken issue with. Of course, we've seen many bitter battles played out uh, between the European Commission and the likes of Apple or Google uh, through the EU courts. And this regulation is really intended to stop those and to prohibit certain behaviours before they come to market. So which platforms, I mean, we've just shown a whole series of logos there um, across the spectrum. Which platforms appear to be on the list? And what are they going to have to do to make reparation or changes? What, what is the next steps? Well, really, of course, that list is still to be confirmed tomorrow. But we have a preliminary idea as to the companies that will face the new rules. And you can safely assume, because there's a series of quantitative thresholds, that certain platforms have to meet in order to be designated. We can assume that the likes of Apple and some of its operating services will come under the scope. The App Store will also be included there. And what this will actually mean, for example, is that Apple may mm -hmm. actually have to allow users to download certain apps from outside of the App Store. So conceivably in the future, we could see iPhone users downloading apps on their iPhone, but from alternative app stores. Uh, other companies like Meta, for example, is likely to see 
the Facebook social network come under the scope of the rules as well as Instagram and some of the obligations in the DMA will mean that Meta can no longer for example share data between those different platform services without first obtaining user permission. Okay, uh, let's see what is in the belly of the report. That is our Bloomberg EU competition reporter, Sam Stolten, there. Coming up, are you working from home? Are you in the office today? Well, the post-pandemic dilemma could be a trillion dollar problem. That's in the years ahead. We dive into today's big take right here on Bloomberg. Most aspects of life have returned to normal in the emerging post-pandemic era. Moviegoers, they're flocking to the cinemas, tourists are jamming the airports for the summer travel, and the kids are returning to the classrooms. But one thing is not back to normal. The return to the office, that's the topic of today's Big Take. Let's bring in uh, Arena Anka on this story. The return to work, the patterns are different depending on where you are, aren't they, in terms of the countries. Who's back in the office? And who's lolling at home on a Monday and Friday? Good morning. Morning. So the U.S. is actually lagging Europe and Asia in the return to office push. Uh, only half of Americans are back in the office compared to over 75 percent in Europe and in the Asia Pacific region. Europe's habits vary widely, but several of its countries are leading the way with laws enshrining flexible schedules, whereas in the US, policymakers stayed silent and they left bosses and employees to navigate changes on their own. And another interesting trend is around digital nomads, so people who move to work remotely from entirely new locations. Now, they used to flock to Portugal and now are looking outside the US and Europe, actually, after rent prices ballooned in Lisbon. And the fastest growing remote working hubs are actually in Asia, in cities like Tokyo and Seoul. Yeah, and there's a whole, whole influx of those digital nomads here in the UAE. The big take. Hop on your Bloomberg, pick up Irina's story there. Uh, Irina Ankel, uh, you can read it all on your town. Let me give you a quick flashcard of what is going on. I think the dollar is the most dominant story as the Aussies call peak rates. Was it that hawkish a hold by the Aussies for the third time? The Aussie has collapsed by 1.3%. Goldman's might be writing for the savior, uh, saying that you could have another rate hike in November, but it's not looking like the market believes that. We're in the calibration phase. The Aussie tanks on the back of weaker Kaishin numbers, and that is it. The services sector in China is under pressure. The dollar is the alpha. Who said exceptionalism was dead? The dollar is up by a half of 1%. It takes its best day in a month as we go. Risk off in equities resplendent in red on the equity column right here on Bloomberg. The dollar is king dollar. Good morning.